Episode 68, The Church in the Dark Ages, Part 6, A Fairly Great Schism. Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy, an Agora Podcast Network member. Go over to agorapodcastnetwork.com to find many more great thought-provoking and independent podcasts. You can learn more about the history of the papacy at A2Z History page. You can also connect and like all the social media and link to iTunes there, where you can leave a rating and review. I'd also like to mention that Beyond the Big Screen has launched. Uh, This is a podcast where we discuss the background and context, along with the true story of some great movies with knowledgeable and interesting guests. You can listen by going to the website a2zhistorypage.com or search for Beyond the Big Screen in iTunes, Acast, or your preferred podcatcher. There are also links in the show notes. If you have a question, comment, or feedback about the history of the papacy beyond the big screen or anything else, really just email me at a2zhistorypage.com. Quickly, the Agora Podcaster of the Month is one of the newest members of the Agora Podcast Network, the Cannonball Podcast. Daniel and Claude, who are the hosts, go through and analyze the canon of Western literature as proposed by Professor Harold Bloom. It's an ambitious and highly entertaining podcast, so I definitely recommend it. Today we're going to look at what was going on with the church and the papacy during the end of the 400s and very early years of the 500s. We're going to view these years through the lens of three popes, Felix III, Galasius and Anastasius II. This period was marked by one schism with the Eastern Church, the Acacian Schism, and the brewings of a Western Schism as well. All this schism occurred in the context of an unsettled political climate in the former Western Roman Empire. Let's start off with Felix III. Now, Felix III reigned nine years from 483 to 492. Technically speaking, if you want to split hairs here, Felix III was actually Felix II. The numbering of the Felixes, if in fact Felixes is the plural of Felix, I'll just go with it, got all messed up after the anti-pope Felix II took over back in the mid-300s. Felix II was an anti-pope who was also martyred as a Catholic, and his name was incorrectly recorded as a legitimate pope. But that's all just an interesting side note. Another interesting side note or footnote on Felix III is that he is a direct ancestor of Pope Gregory the Great, who reigned about a hundred years later from this point in time. His marriage situation is a little unclear. He could have been married earlier in his life, had children, and then was widowed, or any other number of permutations. It does not appear that he was married as Pope, though. Gregory himself will not be a footnote in our story of the Popes, not by a long shot once we get to him. The Felix we are talking about today had his own distinct pile of problems to deal with. The end of the Roman Empire in the West and the transition into the new state of affairs is an endlessly fascinating topic for me, as one can probably tell two episodes on Boethius later. Many scholars and much evidence show that it is much more appropriate to lump this era of the late 400s up to the mid-500s still in the Classical Age or Late Antiquity. When Romulus Augustulus went into early retirement in 476, nothing much changed. It wasn't like there was a healthy, thriving Roman Empire in the West Wednesday morning. Romulus had his retirement party, and then the Middle Ages started afterward. On a special episode of Wittenberg to Westphalia, Ben Jacobs and Travis Dow talked about this at length. The Western Roman Empire had been shrinking for years. New players staked claims in the lands of northwest Africa all the way up to Britain. Things were changing, just not radically at this point. 
that puts the popes in a very interesting position. Many of the Germanic overlords who formed the military aristocracy of the burgeoning kingdoms of Western Europe were Aryan Christians. Were the popes going to cozy up with them? Well, they sort of had to because the Germanic uh, overlords were the power on the streets, so to speak. What about the emperors in Constantinople? Weren't they the true rulers of the Roman Empire and Orthodox Catholic Christians to boot? Yeah, they were, but there was also some problems there, too. In the West, the Christological controversies of the past centuries weren't such a big deal. Of course, the Germanic warrior aristocracy didn't have the same Christology as the Catholic Orthodox Romans, but the two groups stayed on their own turf, religiously speaking. With the exception of North Africa, where the Vandal Aryans did some heavy persecutions, and, well, Britain, where the Christian Romano-British Celts were pushed to the margins of the island. But that was by pagans, so that doesn't really count. Short story, the Germanic Aryans did their thing, and the Roman Catholic Orthodox Chalcedonian Trinitarians did theirs. Not so much in the East. The Mia Monophysite non-Chalcedonians and the Chalcedonians backing two nature Christology followers were fighting tooth and nail over the biggest ancient bishoprics in the East, such as Alexandria and Antioch, as well as a host of smaller ones as well. Felix sent a delegation of legates to Constantinople to talk sense into the Emperor Zeno and the Patriarch Acacius. We talked about Zeno, Acacius, the Henoticon, and the beginnings of schism way back in episode 64. It's hilarious. In summary, the Henoticon was a political document developed by the Emperor Zeno to smooth over the problems between the supporters of the Council of Chalcedon and the haters of Chalcedon, namely the Monophysites. The Henoticon could have worked. Many of the bishops of the East, both Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, were willing to ascribe to the document. The Henoticon sort of threw the Chalcedonians under the bus, but only a little. There was a dispute over succession to the Patriarchate of Alexandria between a Monophysite bishop named Peter Mongus and a Chalcedonian bishop named John Teleia. John went back to Rome and Felix for a redress of his grievances. The Henoticon and the situation in Alexandria were the main reasons for Felix sending the delegation of legates to Constantinople mentioned a moment ago. Something went wrong with that delegation. At a liturgy or mass ceremony, Acacius included Peter Mongus in the diptychs. The diptychs is a recitation and prayers for the official lists of bishops and patriarchs who are in communion with the bishops or priests conducting the liturgy. If you are a Roman Catholic today, you will hear this part, which will be a prayer for the Pope and the bishop around the last quarter of the math or so. For modern Orthodox, it's in the latter half of the liturgy. I haven't the foggiest where it would be for Eastern Constantinopolitan Christians 1,500 years ago, but it doesn't really matter. What does matter is the legates from Pope Felix didn't say anything, despite the fact that Peter Mongus was excommunicated in the eyes of Felix. Part of the legation's job was to get Mongus deposed, yet here they are celebrating him as Patriarch of Alexandria. The papal legation may have even agreed to the Henoticon. When the legation got back to Rome, there was hell to pay. The entire papal delegation was excommunicated as soon as they got home. Felix went and excommunicated Acacius as well for his troubles. There is a story that Felix sent another set of legates to Constantinople in order to affect or notify Acacius of, the, of his excommunication. They did this by walking up to Acacius while he was performing a liturgy and pinning the notice of excommunication on his patriarchal vestments. I can imagine that didn't go down very well at all. For all that, Acacius was still patriarch of Constantinople for the rest of his life. The emperor of the east didn't seem to care either. 
I get the picture in my mind of Acacius and Zeno being slightly indignant at first that the Pope would send people to excommunicate Acacius by pinning a letter on his smock like a kindergartner. Then, after a while, they just laughed it off, like, (laughs) who cares what Felix has to say anyways? The Eastern emperors and patriarchs always wanted the Pope on their side, but on their terms, that suited them. The Acacian Schism went on until 1519, 34 long years, because both sides wanted to be back in communion, but just couldn't bridge the gap to go for a full rapprochement. Felix, as we see, was not a very lax man. He was incredibly rigid. Another important decision he made was to be quite harsh to Catholics in North Africa who changed allegiances to Arianism. Remember, the Vandals were running the show in North Africa, and they were zealous Arians, unlike most of their Germanic brethren. We have seen many times in the past where, during persecutions, Orthodox Catholic Christians would cave in a bit to get along. The popes in Rome were always giving these people a relatively lax route back into the church. Not so with Felix. He laid down that clergy who became Arian could only receive communion on their deathbed, as long as they followed strict penance for the rest of their lives. This was a major reversal and starts to show a change in course for the office of Pope on theological and pastoral matters. Felix also wrote about and strongly condemned certain old pagan practices that were still floating around, like Lupercalia. Felix was a strong-headed bishop who strongly pushed for Roman papal power and authority. The papacy of Felix III and his successor sort of blend together. There is a strong continuity of priorities and actions between the two. You could even say Galasius took everything Felix did and brought it up to the next level. Galasius was an interesting character for many, many reasons. He's really one of the more interesting popes from this period, but he gets overshadowed by greater names like Leo and Gregory. He only reigned from 492 to 496, but Galasius was more than likely Felix III's archdeacon, or vice-pope almost, so he was definitely no novice in the halls of power, and he knew the ropes. A little fact about Galasius before we get too far, he was the last African pope, and beside a spate of popes in the 600s and 700s from Syria, one of the last non-European popes before Francis I. There were a couple of popes from Syria during this time when the Byzantine Empire had sway over the election of popes, but after that it would be in the neighborhood of 1,300 years before there was another pope not from Europe. Galasius was either born in Roman Africa or was of Roman African descent. The Liber Pontificalis says he was African by nationality, but doesn't say where he was actually born. Based on that tiny shred of information, we can draw almost any conclusion about his background we want, which opens the door for all sorts of great speculation. I really like to speculate about Galasius' birth because it ties in so many of the threads of the end of the Roman Empire and late antiquity. The vague African origins of Galasius let us explore some different aspects of Western Roman and Christian history and culture. Ideas of nationality and citizenship were much more fluid in the past than they are now, and they were especially fluid during late antiquity and early medieval Western Europe. Galasius was no doubt a Roman and an African, which meant the environs in and around Carthage specifically. One possibility is that Galasius was born to Roman parents before the Vandal conquest of North Africa in 439. That easily fits into the timeline since that was only a scant 53 years before Galasius was elevated to Pope in Rome. How did Galasius arrive in Rome, and why would a person from North Africa be elected pope when most popes were chosen from among the local Roman city population, especially amongst the aristocracy? As we've said in the past, North Africa was the heartland of Western Roman Christianity, even rivaling Rome and Italy. Just think about Augustine of Hippo, who died as the Vandals were conquering North Africa. 
Roman North Africa was incredibly wealthy and culturally as Roman or more so than any place in the empire. Galatius was an incredibly wealthy pope and was known for spending his money on the poor and the church. What I think happened, and this is my opinion on the evidence, is that Galatius and his family were wealthy land-owning patricians who beat it out of North Africa when the Vandals came knocking down the door. Many wealthy Romans did, in fact, flee North Africa to Sicily and Italy to get away from the Vandals. Galatius was Roman, but chances are he also had native Berber and even Greek roots if his ancestors were longtime residents of North Africa. Whatever the case of his background, Galatius marks a very interesting part of late antiquity Roman history. He is an artifact of a time in history where events were rapidly changing and how and where people lived was also changing incredibly quickly. Galatius was a prolific letter writer, and it shows that something of the old Roman system was holding together as late as the end of the 400s. Horizons were shrinking, but there was still a degree of interconnectedness between Rome and Constantinople and other parts of the empire as well. Speaking of the wider political world, Galatius jumped on the Theodoric train early and had good relations with them. We'll save Galatius' views on ecclesiastical and secular power until a little later in the episode. Galatius was dealing with all the same stuff as Felix did with the Acacian Schism. There really wasn't any fallout from the schism. It was just a simmering conflict between Constantinople and Rome. Acacius died in 489, but Galatius was still mad that his name was included on the diptychs of Constantinople. The next few patriarchs of Constantinople wanted to heal the rift with Rome, but they just couldn't understand what the big deal was about Acacius. Acacius was an Orthodox Chalcedonian bishop to them. He just so happened to agree with a political compromise. Acacius was also held in high esteem among the Monophysites, the people who it was much more important for Constantinople to come to a settlement with than the Western Church. So complications abound on this one. The Acacian Schism just kept heating up. This is possibly what makes it more important than any of the schisms that happened before. If you're looking from Galatius' perspective, there are some wins and losses, but probably predictable losses. The Bishop of Thessalonica, which was still technically under the Bishop of Rome's authority, sided with Constantinople and added Acacius to their diptychs. That isn't really surprising. Thessalonica, Greece, and the southern Balkans had been breaking for Constantinople for some time. But now the rift between these areas and Rome became even wider. Galatius was able to shore up some of his areas of support, though. Sections of Italy and Dalmatia fell into line in rejecting and taking out Pelagianism in their turf on Galatius' terms. It was good that Italian dioceses were coming into line for the papacy, because you do have to remember a good piece of Italy falls under the Magna Graecia title. So Galatius would have had to make sure that the Greeks in his midst were happy and loyal. Dalmatia is interesting because if you look at a modern map of the Balkans, the lines between Catholicism, Western Christian, and Orthodox, Eastern Christian spheres basically falls along the lines established all the way back to this time in the late 400s. That wasn't all Galatius had to say about the Acacian Schism. There's one more piece worth mentioning. Galatius wrote the new Eastern Emperor Anastasius a letter called Duo Sunt, which said there were two powers in the world. There is the sacred power of priests and popes, and then the royal power of kings, princes, emperors, etc. The sacred and the profane have their own spheres of influence, 
but the royal power is at the end of the day lesser than the religious power because the religious power is responsible for salvation of souls. Since salvation of the souls is the most important thing in the world, the power of the priest should come first if there's any conflict. If anything marked the beginning of the medieval church-state relationship, this one letter did. Duo Sunt is the go on the Monopoly board that goes through Charlemagne, the investiture controversy, Urban II, and Boniface VIII's Unum Sanctum to what we to the High Middle Ages. It's really it all starts to fall into place here. I'll wrap up Galatius's pontificate with two other points. Later sources say Galatius created a list of canonical books of the New and Old Testament. The letters are attributed to Galatius, but they were probably much later. This shows the canon of scripture was still in development as late as the 500s AD. He might not have solidified the canon, but he did write extensively on theology and Christology. He also made great strides in developing the Roman Mass. Finally, Galatia stamped on one of the last Roman pagan customs of Lupercalia. The Lupercalia festival was a multi-day festival in the middle of February, usually around the 13th to the 15th of that month. There is a great deal of ink spilt on whether the Valentine's Day holiday was meant to replace Lupercalia. You can easily go down the rabbit hole on that one. Maybe Valentine's Day did go, was placed in uh, in that slot to overshadow Lupercalia. There's no compelling evidence either way, and it probably really doesn't matter, because holiday syncretization was much more organic than just slapping a different label on a pre-existing holiday. There was a lot of other factors that went into it. We are going to talk about one more pope today because he set off a schism in the West outside of the larger East-West schism. Anastasius II took over the reins about eight months after the death of Galasius in 496. He only reigned two years. He died in November 498, but a lot can happen in two years. There's no record as to what the holdup was on electing a new pope. It was almost eight months. One possibility is that there was a disagreement between the hard-line camp against Constantinople and the group that wanted to build stronger ties to Constantinople in the Eastern Empire. Just to make things a little bit more complicated, the emperor in Constantinople at this point name was also Anastasius. You know what I said about a lot can happen, but one thing that didn't happen during this papacy was that Anastasius was accredited with a letter that he had supposedly written to Clovis of the Franks on the occasion of his baptism. That letter was a clear forgery. One of the biggest red flags on that one is that Clovis was baptized in 508 AD, 10 years after Anastasius the Pope died. Anastasius applied a very different strategy to dealing with the Acacian Schism. Back to the well, our continuing theme of the Acacian Schism, Anastasius applied a very different strategy in dealing with this Acacian Schism. He was much more lenient than Galasius or Felix III. Anastasius was willing to go a long way to appease Constantinople and even participated in communion with the Bishop of Thessalonica, who was a partisan of Acacius. For all this appeasing, Anastasius still couldn't accept Acacius in the diptychs, but he didn't want to force the issue. Anastasius, through his legates, was a go-between for a deal between Emperor Anastasius and the king of the Ostrogoths, Theodoric, that they had been working on for quite some time. The plan was the Emperor Anastasius would grant or accept the kingship of Theodoric if Theodoric accepted the Hanoticon. I mean, what the heck did Theodoric care about the Hanoticon? None of it meant anything to him religiously. So what did he have to lose by signing this document? Pope Anastasius dug the hole deeper with many of the clergy by agreeing to this deal. 
many, many people in the Roman church thought of Anastasius as a traitor at this point. Dante includes Anastasius in the sixth circle of hell, the circle of the heretics. A little side note on Anastasius, he is one of the very few popes who is not sainted or in the process of being sainted. When Anastasius up and died out of nowhere in 498, many, probably his enemies one would suppose, said it was a divine intervention. Because Anastasius died completely out of the blue, Rome was thrown into an uproar as to what to do and how to proceed with the biggest issue of the day, the Acacian Schism. Many clergy, with the support of the Roman aristocracy, were strongly in favor of re-establishing communion with Constantinople. Another group were vehemently against any reconciliation with Constantinople as long as the Honoticon was still on the table and Acacius was still in the diptychs. The situation is about to get a whole lot messier, so I hope you join us the next time to see how they sort all of this out. A huge shout-out goes to our Rome-level patron, Peter the Great. Big thank yous also to our Constantinople-level patrons on patreon.com forward slash papacy, Regan, Sandy, Andy, Paul, Dr. Jeff, Robert, Sean, and Yoren. I also want to thank and a huge shout-out to our Alexandria-level patrons, Chris and Francine. I really sincerely appreciate you taking the time to listen, and I look forward to seeing you on our next stop on our trip through the history of the Roman popes and Christian church.